Public Travel is pleased to bring you this webinar today, The Monarch Migration Story, How Butterflies Help Us Understand Our Changing World, with Dr. Jarrett Daniels and Kristen Grace. One of the most amazing phenomena in nature is the annual migration of millions of monarch butterflies southward from their breeding grounds in the United States and Canada to their overwintering sites in Mexico. Unfortunately, climate change and deforestation are severely threatening this migration. This last year was particularly bad for monarchs, with a 26% drop in population as reported by the World Wildlife Fund. During our webinar today, we'll hear from Dr. Jarrett Daniels from the Florida Museum of Natural History. Dr. Daniels directs the Museum's Butterfly Conservation Program, which uses a variety of strategies to reduce butterfly extinction. We'll learn more about the story of the monarch butterfly, including conservation measures and what we can all do to help. And we'll also hear from Kristen Grace, the resident photographer at the Florida Museum. We'll get to see some of Kristen's beautiful images today, and she'll share a little bit about her experience as a photographer in the monarch sanctuary. We'll have time for questions at the end. So again, please submit those at any point and we'll share them with our guests later on. Uh, a little bit more about our guests. Dr. Jarrett Daniels currently serves as curator at the McGuire Center for Lepidoptera and Biodiversity at the Florida Museum of Natural History, and as an associate professor, excuse me, a professor uh, of entomology at the University of Florida. Dr. Daniels is a professional nature photographer, an author, a native plant enthusiast, and an entomologist. He is particularly interested in at-risk butterfly and native insect pollinator conservation, and he has authored numerous scientific papers, popular articles, and books on gardening, wildlife conservation, wildflowers, insects, and butterflies. We're also joined today by Kristen Grace, the resident photographer and digital asset manager for the Florida Museum of Natural History. Kristen has been a professional photographer since 2004, and she specializes in documentary photography, photojournalism, nature photography, and editorial photography. She has a passion for SCICOM, informal science education through photography, youth photography, and youth mentorship, with specifics in outdoor adventures and engaging with nature. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over. Uh, Dr. Daniels, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I really appreciate it. And um, thank you all for joining us today um, on this webinar. I, um, I really always welcome the opportunity to talk about butterflies, really a portion of my, um, excuse me, uh, my, my passion in the natural world. And this particular um, element of um, natural history, which of course is the monarch migration story. And before we get started, I, I just want to give a little bit of background on the monarch itself. And I think we all know that the monarch butterfly is arguably one of the most iconic and beloved insects in North America. And there's no real surprise why that is, right? It's a cosmopolitan insect. It occurs in urban, suburban landscapes, as well as out in the countryside. It's a large butterfly that we have invite into our landscapes. Uh, it's bright and colorful. It has an association with milkweeds and sequesters toxic chemicals, which render the adult butterflies, their larvae and their pupae, distasteful to a variety of predators, including birds. And of course, it undergoes this annual mass migration, which is arguably one of the most uh, amazing natural events on the planet. And that's what we're here to talk a little bit about today. But just for orientation, if you look at the US and Southern Canada, and the populations of monarch butterflies that exist, there are actually three distinct populations. To the west of the Rocky Mountains, there's a smaller western population that predominantly overwinters along coastal California. Down here in the Sunshine State, particularly down around the Miami-Dade area, there is a non-migratory resident population of monarchs, which does not migrate and breeds year-round in southern Florida. And then there's a large migratory population that occupies much of the eastern U.S. and southern Canada. And this is the, uh, the area in which the butterflies move on a southwest or southerly direction to overwinter in the mountains of Mexico. So it's a, even from a migratory point of view, it is a little bit of a complex story. And if you drill down a little bit further in and along the Gulf Coast, there are actually sort of three distinct uh, Kind of lifestyles of the monarch. There's, of course, the migratory population that moves southward in the fall of the year and then moves along the Gulf Coast, uh, ending up in the mountains of Mexico. 
Some of them also funnel into peninsular Florida and fall out of migration and breed year round in Southern Florida. And then increasingly due to climate change and the proliferation of non-native tropical milkweed, we have winter breeding that is an opportunistic breeding that occurs from about Charleston, South Carolina, uh, west along the Gulf Coast to about Austin, Texas each year. And so these were initially migratory individuals that sort of fell out of migration and take advantage of the conditions that they encountered to breed opportunistically during the winter months. And of course, this is a non-preferred behavior, right? Because during the winter months, we often have freeze and frost events that come along that can wipe out the plants and the butterflies as well. So this is um, an effect of the, the changing climate and the anthropogenic changes that we see happening all around us. And if you look at that Eastern population, uh, the bulk of that uh, population from the Midwest and Great Plains are the individuals that eventually make their way down into Mexico. But of course, this includes monarchs from all around uh, portions of the East and Southern Canada. And I like this slide simply because it does show kind of the percentages of um, the Eastern population that make up the overwintering populations in Mexico. And so as we move southward with the monarch uh, as part of our Holbrook uh, trip to see the overwintering colonies, we arrive in Mexico City uh, for the first day and it gives us an opportunity to acclimate to the high elevation um, conditions to uh, make sure we don't have altitude sickness and an opportunity to explore uh, around uh, some of the beautiful sights and scenery of Mexico City proper. And then the next morning after a, a hearty breakfast and a little bit of additional exploration, we aboard um, our motor coach and we take a, about a three and a half hour journey to the west uh, into a more mountainous region in the state of Michoacan and eventually end up in the town of Angangueo, which is really the heart of the monarch overwintering populations. And as soon as you enter into Anangueo, you immediately see that the town is really adorned with um, uh, monarchs, uh, scenery, uh, kind of welcoming the, the, the monarchs into the state of Michoacan. So it's very much adorned with beauty of the monarch itself. And then we arrive at a very eclectic hotel, the Don Bruno, which has kind of been the, the base camp for most of the Holbrook trips over the years. And it doesn't necessarily look like much on the outside, but as soon as you pass through those um, arches, you arrive at the uh, kind of the, the courtyard, which is uh, arguably one of the more beautiful locations to use as a base camp. Uh, multiple stories of rooms, a wonderful courtyard to enjoy drinks and cocktails with friends, and a great place to just uh, hang out and enjoy the, the climate at this time during the year. And after um, a kind of a good evening in uh, Angeo after dinner, we have an opportunity to uh, grab a cocktail. And this is actually a, a postdoc of mine, Chase Kimmel, that uh, after dinner grabbed a, a Modelo to just kind of hang out and enjoy the scenery and the sunset over the town of Angeo. It's a very beautiful place just to uh, to relax and soak up some of the scenery. And you'll see that electric blue sky in the background. This time of year, humidities are really low, which makes for uh, really comfortable conditions. In fact, oftentimes very cool conditions and spectacular sunsets as well. And we also have an opportunity to um, kind of learn a little bit more about the monarch uh, migration, a little bit more about uh, monarch biology. So here is yours truly kind of going through an old fashioned PowerPoint, if you will, uh, to tell our guests about uh, the life history and ecology of the monarch before we make our next day's trek to our first of two uh, overwintering colonies. And then the next morning we leave bright and early, again, board our air conditioned and very comfortable motor coach and make our way to one of the first um, uh, colonies. This is the, the overwintering um, site of Sierra Chinqua. And uh, as you can see here in this picture, there is a, a lot of great uh, interpretation uh, to take in. And we are greeted here by one of our uh, in-country uh, guides. This is Daniel, who is a, a wonderful young man and knows a lot about the migration, the monarch, 
uh, the town of Anangueo and the overall culture of Mexico. And he's giving us a little bit of an orientation about what we'll be doing for the rest of the day, kind of how we'll be moving through the colonies, kind of the you know, right things to do, wrong things to do, and uh, an opportunity for us to just um, understand a little more about what we'll be seeing over the next several hours. And then um, it is a little bit of a hike to get to the first uh, colony. So uh, those that are a little bit more adventuresome will go on foot. Uh, however, we do have horses available. And so if you are uh, particularly interested in boarding a horse and taking the truly scenic road up the mountain, this is uh, certainly a very wonderful way of enjoying uh, the forest and ultimately arriving at the monarch overwintering site. And the scenery is uh, arguably quite spectacular. We are in high elevation oil mill fir forests and the scenery seems to go on and on and on as you can see by the mountain ranges uh, ahead of us in the distance in this slide. And so the slow ride by horseback is a great way of enjoying kind of the uh, you know, hour long trek up the mountain to get to the overwintering site. So it really depends on your fortitude, on your uh, what you really enjoy, but this is a great way of going. And as we get a little closer to the actual colony, which does change from year to year as to, where, as to where it actually occurs within the forest, we start seeing some of the early signs of monarchs being in the area. This is a small stream and you can see in one of Kristen Grace's wonderful uh, picture is some of the monarchs coming down to grab a drink of water. And um, as you get a little bit closer, you will soon uh, see that the trees, the limbs, and the trunks are truly covered in hundreds and hundreds of uh, monarchs, thousands, and even millions of monarch butterflies, depending on the size of the colony in any given year. And this is the traditional view that many people expect to see, kind of butterflies clustered on trees like grapes hanging on a vine. But as soon as the sun comes up and starts hitting those overhanging branches with the monarchs on them, they literally explode outward. And so this is a very dynamic experience. It's not a static uh, view of the monarchs. There is bursts of activity throughout the day, monarchs coming down to envelop you, come down to seek water and nectar. So it's not like those National Geographic images where you're seeing them from afar and you're just sort of enjoying that view. It's a very, very dynamic experience. And also I always encourage people to look upward because we're often focused on a, a pretty narrow view of the forest. But as you look up to the canopy, you can see the stream of butterflies over your head, which if you can sit out there from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m., really does not stop. So you get a better sense of the volume of butterflies, which can be in the hundreds of millions from year to year. So it's, it's truly a unique experience that cannot be uh, really almost anticipated without being there in person. And as the sunlight uh, you know, kind of envelops the forest, you will see them coming down to warm up and kind of bask in that bright sunlight. Uh, and another wonderful photo of Kristen's here, which shows you know, probably you know, a few hundred butterflies just sitting on leaves with their wings spread, kind of using them as little solar reflectors to uh, warm their thoracic muscles in order to fly. You'll see them landing on flowers to nectar, because again, these are high elevation, dry forests, and they have to fuel up during the day. They can also get desiccated quite a bit, so they need to find water and energy to make sure that they can survive the fairly long, arduous winter uh, in the overwintering colonies themselves. And then after that very uh, satisfying day in the uh, overwintering colonies of Sierra Chinqua, we return back to the town of Angeo and an opportunity to take a walking tour in this very, very charming little town, which again, as I mentioned earlier, is really adorned uh, by all things monarch. And here we have the actual town of Angeo in letters, and you can see the mural of monarchs and a person posing in the foreground uh, beyond, um, in, in front of a, a monarch chair, if you will. So it's a great place to really soak up local culture, see how the town itself celebrates the annual migration of the monarch, see the multitude of murals and the artwork in the town that you can encounter. Many of these are really spectacular and 
little hidden gems around every corner, and then uh, a wonderful view at sunset. It is truly a beautiful town, uh, kind of settled in the valley of the mountains here. And depending on how the monarch colony is going, even in the evening, you can see monarchs kind of flitting through the town itself and then heading back up uh, in elevation to seek their overwintering locations for uh, the nighttime. So it's a, it's a wonderful time to just soak up local culture. And then the next day we board the bus again and we go to a little bit more of a popular overwintering location. This is the um, uh, overwintering colony of El Rosario. And this is arguably one of the most accessible locations. And uh, here people are waiting to grab their uh, bag lunch before heading up. Many will grab a walking stick as well. And it's a great opportunity to interact with um, other visitors, including many locals that are available to ask questions to and just interact with. And you'll see all ages from young toddlers up to individuals in their 80s and 90s coming from Mexico City and all parts around Mexico to see the monarch overwintering colonies. It's one of the few locations for an ecotourism destination where foreigners are significantly outnumbered by locals. And so truly in-country individuals embrace the monarch migration and the overwintering colonies as part of their natural heritage. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. And then on the trek to the um, uh, colony itself, there are many vendors. So again, you can kind of uh, get a flavor for the uh, artisanal workings of the local community. And then we arrive uh, at kind of the, the gateway to El Rosario. And it's a again, adorned by everything monarch. Um, and you will see many, many schools uh, visits as well. Here is a, a kind of an, um, uh, maybe a fifth grade or sixth grade class uh, posing in front of the archway to El Rosario. So many opportunities to interact with people of all ages and all nationalities. And then you also will pass um, uh, a, an oil mill fur nursery run by the World Wildlife Fund and an opportunity to see restoration actually in practice. So these seedlings will be outplanted around the periphery of El Rosario to help reforest um, the colony from uh, uh, historic deforestation. And then once you uh, trek up a little bit further, you are truly in the heart of the monarch colony itself. And this is arguably one of the largest colonies on a year in and year out basis. And again, featuring Kristen's wonderful photography here, you can see that the fir forest is literally adorned canopy down to the, to the, uh, the base by monarchs, including the trunks of the trees, which are literally covered in a 360 degree circumference by the monarchs. And in the photo on the left, you'll be hard pressed to actually see the bark of the trees with the monarchs uh, uh, kind of resting on those uh, trees themselves. And this is one of the few locations in the, um, the monarch world where there are so many monarch butterflies that you can hear the individual wing beats. And so uh, from the forest floor with monarchs coming down to bask all the way up to uh, the individual flowers blooming and monarchs coming down to nectar. And then of course, any area that has moisture, this is a small stream, monarchs are parading down to get a sip of water again to kind of replenish their, um, their bodies through uh, because of the dehydration that takes place during the, uh, the overnight conditions. And you can again see the stream of monarchs in this video that really do not stop. So this is essentially when we enter the monarch snow globe experience where you are literally enveloped uh, entirely around you with a stream of monarch butterflies that literally does not stop from the time you enter the colony to the time that you leave. And you might say, well, you know, you can understand what this experience is like, but I would say that in every trip that we have led, when people come and actually see the monarch butterflies streaming around them, it's a unique experience unlike any other. And most people are almost brought to tears by this experience. It truly is um, a, a spiritual experience, if you will, in mother nature. And it's something that even if you've been here a hundred times before, you never get sick of seeing. It's, it, each trip is unique, each experience is unique, and 
to be in one place where you can literally be uh, experiencing hundreds of millions of monarchs is something that is truly on everybody's bucket list. Excuse me. And again, they, they truly, uh, again, surround you. They will land on you. Uh, so many opportunities to just sit back, soak in the experience for those of you that want to uh, indulge in photography. This is probably, again, one of the best locations for nature photography that you can experience. There is no shortage of pictures to be taken and no shortage of experiences to be had. And uh, again, here's yours truly. And the individual on the left-hand side is actually one of the listing biologists for the US Fish and Wildlife Service who is actually in charge of uh, assessing the monarch as an endangered species under the ESA. And this was her first trip to the monarch overwintering colonies. And you can see the delight on her face. She was just um, truly brought to tears by this experience. So whether you're you know, an avocational photographer or a hardened scientist, you never get sick of this experience. And then another uh, great video that Kristen has taken, this is El Rosario looking out into a um, kind of an open meadow. And again, you can see the volume of monarch butterflies in this picture, but again, seeing it in video form really does it justice because again, truly a monarch snow globe, uh, monarch butterflies raining down into the valley and moving back up into the tree canopy uh, on a nonstop stream that really occupies almost eight hours during the daytime. So, you know, a remarkable experience to encounter. And this is a place where I think uh, also a great opportunity just to sit back and enjoy the experience. You, whether you wanna hike miles during your daytime or just pick a location and soak it in during the daytime, it's, uh, there is no bad experience in the monarch overwintering colonies themselves. And depending if you arrive early into the colony or for those trips later in the year into the end of February and early March, what you might also encounter are some of the monarch butterflies actually starting to court and mate. And this is a male and female butterfly in copula. And at the end of the uh, season of the overwintering colony, you will see this in more and more uh, time uh, happening in front of you where males and females are mating and soon the monarch colonies will break up and the monarch butterflies will disperse back northward. And so this is part of the annual cycle of the migration. And if you're really, really lucky, you can see some of the monarchs actually leaving the colony. And this again happens almost in like a magical burst with thousands and thousands of monarchs heading back north uh, out of the colonies themselves. And so that takes us to this slide again, kind of the re-migration, repopulating much of North America at the end of uh, the overwinning time in late February and early March. And so it's a one-way migration down, but a multi-generational stepwise migration back north. So those individuals that you saw mating, the female butterflies will disperse out of that colony, they'll fly northward and they might originate, uh, they might end up in uh, say Southern Texas or maybe Austin or Houston, and they will find milkweed there, lay their eggs and then die. And their offspring will move further north, maybe into the Great Plains, find milkweed there, die. And their offspring will then recolonize much of the Northern tier of the US and Southern Canada. So the same individuals move southward in the fall but the great, great grandchildren of those repopulate Southern Canada each year. So one ways migration down and a stepwise migration back north. And you might say, well, why does the monarch do this? Well, if you leave um, the overwintering colonies in late February and you fly to Minneapolis, St. Paul, it's not gonna be the best conditions in which to continue breeding. So they're following springtime latitudinally as it uh, extends northward throughout uh, the, uh, the states and they're finding milkweed as they go along. And so they will use a wide variety of different milkweeds. And then if you're along the Gulf Coast, many of those individuals that uh, kind of disperse out of the colony will themselves move along the Gulf Coast and repopulate Florida. So the monarchs can essentially be found here in Florida in that remigration from late February through early and mid-April. And so 
uh, despite being one of the most well-studied insects, there are so many additional mysteries regarding this individual butterfly that we still as scientists want to unravel. So even though a lot of energy and a lot of time and money have gone into studying the monarch, every year there are new discoveries and every year there are opportunities for citizen scientists or community scientists to participate in helping the scientific community unravel these experiences. So whether you're in your backyard in uh, uh, Toledo, Ohio, or in Gainesville, Florida, you can help scientists understand the monarch migration. Uh, and there are many wonderful community science projects online that you can participate in to do, to do this and help uh, kind of advance the, the knowledge base of the monarch itself. And of course, we also know, and many of you have probably heard reports over the last 20 years that the monarch itself is not doing very well. It is struggling to survive in that migratory life cycle. And in fact, distressing uh, trends over the last 20 years have come out of the West and the East, so much so that the Western population is down to less than 1% of its historic size. And it's kind of hovering on that quasi extinction threshold. So it is truly in trouble in the West and the East is faring a little bit better, but still between 1996 and 2014 and 2015, we're down about 84 to 85% of that overall population level within the East. So even a, a very ubiquitous common butterfly like the monarch is struggling. And uh, I would gauge to say that if you would go back in time and ask scientists, they would never have thought that such a common butterfly that occurs in so many different areas could be under threat of decline. And over the last several years, of course, owing to these declines, it was actually petitioned for listing as endangered, as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act, uh, a review that's still ongoing. So it is possible that if declines continue that the monarch could actually be listed as threatened or endangered uh, in years upcoming. So never would I have imagined that the butterfly would be in this predicament. It's certainly not in danger of going extinct as an individual species, but that migratory life cycle is certainly in danger of, um, of declining year after year. And so if you really want to experience uh, what we just showed you in visual form, I would argue to go as soon as you can to see the overwintering colonies because uh, truly from year to year, the numbers do vary and there's no uh, really secure future for this butterfly moving forward. And so that brings us to the point of well, what can we do right here at home to help the monarch ensure that the migratory life cycle continues to be vibrant um, and we build those numbers back uh, up, uh, whether you're in the great Midwest or down here in the South. And one of the main driving factors for this decline has been loss of breeding habitat, both in the East and in the West. And so the monarch butterfly is, is closely tied to the existence of milkweed as a larval host, but also other flowering plants. So what you can do right here at home is to plant milkweed and plant other flowering plants to build back that breeding habitat. And because the butterfly is so cosmopolitan, it doesn't matter if you're in downtown Atlanta or rural parts of Alabama, you can play a role with your landscape. Now more than ever, all landscapes matter when it comes to uh, helping the monarch butterfly. And at the Florida Museum of Natural History, we are trying to also help by uh, doing research to understand how these landscapes can contribute and what actually makes the biggest difference. So one landscape that I think we see every day are roadsides. And these are often, especially in the spring of the year, kind of blanketed with beautiful, colorful flowering plants, but these are much more functional landscapes for insects overall. And they can be managed so that monarch butterflies themselves can benefit from this. And we partnered with the Florida Department of Transportation to survey milkweed populations along uh, FDOT maintained roadways. And this is one of the most important native milkweeds to the return migration of the monarch here in the deep south. This is pine woods milkweed Asclepius humastrata. And we work with DOT to map monarch populations. And so all the roadways that you see here highlighted in blue have fairly good populations of 
this pine woods milkweed. Those that are highlighted in red have ultra high density stands of milkweed. So as the Department of Transportation looks at managing roadways through mowing, they could look at these locations and say, hey, we know where these populations are. We can reduce our mowing frequency to ensure that these plants are available to the monarch when they're colonizing Florida at the beginning of spring. And we can also enable these plants to go through their life cycle so they successfully set seed and these populations do not dwindle over time, but they actually can proliferate through the spread of, of seed and extend those populations even outward more. And this data has been used uh, to enter into the National Canada Conservation Agreement with assurances with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And this is a complicated name, but what it really means is that transportation and energy providers across the country enter into an agreement where they promise to manage their landscapes, in this case roadways, for the benefit of the monarch to ensure that they do no harm and actually make sure that their management actions can have a net benefit to the monarch. And so it shows that research right here at home can have a really significant impact in how agencies view uh, the landscape that they manage and the ways in which they promise to manage these landscapes in benefit for biodiversity as a whole, but of course also for the monarch and other insect pollinators. And then we're also working with the Department of Transportation to revegetate retention basins along roadways, planting colorful flowering plants and also host plants for the monarch to turn these once desolate landscapes into true habitat that can beautify these landscapes and also provide resources, not only for the monarchs, but for other wildlife as well. And so these are kind of no brainer projects, right? These are opportunities to transform landscapes that otherwise are managed just for a stable state into a much more diverse, rich landscape that can have benefit to, to many organisms as well as provide beautification for people going along Florida roadways. And these are pictures of some of our vegetation projects, uh, planting both by seed and plugs of flowers and larval host plants into these landscapes. And here you can see some of the scope at which we operate. So our goal is to continue to work on revegetating these projects and hopefully monitor them for recolonization by the monarch and use by other wildlife and then use the lessons learned here to develop best practices that could be utilized elsewhere throughout the southeast and even beyond with the goal of creating more and more available habitat for monarch butterflies and other wildlife. And Another thing that we're working on here at the University of Florida is a UF wildlife friendly certification program for the plants that if you go to a nursery and you wanna purchase for wildlife as a whole, too often many of these are sprayed with chemicals that might be uh, unsafe for raising monarch caterpillars or for bees uh, trying to collect pollen. So we're trying to work with growers and develop best standards so that when you buy plants at a nursery, whether it's a big box store or a local specialty nursery, you will eventually hope, hopefully see a label that says these plants are actually certified wildlife safe so that you have confidence that the plants you're buying are appropriate for the organisms you want to attract and that they're safe for utilizing in your landscape to again, attract wildlife and promote biodiversity right here at home. And Ultimately, the goal is to diversify our landscapes to ensure that they are beautiful to our eyes, but they are also uh, sustainable and also attract and maintain habitat for other organisms. And so kind of ending today on my portion is kind of four simple things that we can all do right in our own landscapes or our own communities to help the monarch and also other wildlife. And those are plant native milkweed. Monarch butterflies rely on milkweed as pretty much a dominant sole larval host plant. And native milkweeds are by far better than non-native plants. So go to, a no, go to a local nursery, go to a big box store and ask them to carry native milkweed if they don't. And if they do plant that, encourage that use in your landscape and your neighbor's landscape. And again, feed the migration because it's not all about just larval host plants in your landscape, but making sure that monarch butterflies on their long journey south each fall 
a journey that can extend over 3,000 miles, that they have the resources they need to make that journey safely and effectively. And that means an abundance of flowering plants to provide nectar and fuel for that long journey. And then enjoy monarchs in the wild instead of rearing them indoors. Uh, monarch butterflies are wild organisms and uh, really keeping them safe means keeping them outdoors and enjoying them in nature, not necessarily bringing them into your yard, into your home and raising them. There are many problems that can happen uh, with exercises like that. And then last, and, and maybe even uh, as importantly, is share your sightings uh, with that broader community of scientists. Because as I mentioned earlier, we're still learning so much about this butterfly and its migration that every one of us can collect and transmit data uh, online, whether it be through iNaturalist, through Monarch Watch, through many community science projects that we can provide valuable data that helps us better understand not only the migration, but how we can really contribute to ensuring that the monarch butterfly and ultimately its migration is here for the foreseeable future. So that 10 years from now, when people go down to Michoacan and see the overwintering colonies, they can experience what you saw here today, keeping the monarch butterfly safe, secure, and opportunities for that long-term conservation is what we need to strive for. So with that, I'll end and turn over uh, the next part of the webinar to Kristen Grace, our museum photographer. Thank you, Dr. Daniels, for that informative talk. <laughs> the Florida Museum's motto is inspiring people to care about life on Earth. As a visual storyteller, I cannot think of a more impactful way to inspire people to care about nature and more specifically the plight of the monarch migration than by being granted the opportunity to document this natural phenomenon. <laughs> My images hardly do the phenomenon justice. Just being there is, um, is way better <laughs> than looking at it with pictures. The town of Angangueo was deemed a magic town or Pueblo Magico by Mexico's Secretary of Tourism, and rightfully so. This town is nestled among one of the most magical episodes in nature. Visually, it's hard to not be overwhelmed with opportunity when standing in a forest that is collectively moving on orange wings. Uh, this trip in 2019 was not my first chance to see the migration. I had the opportunity in 2008 when I was working as photographer for the University of Florida News Bureau. And that trip was in January, it was much colder. The butterflies still clung to the trees and the only ones moving were the ones that had fallen to the forest floor. It was still a marvel, but I longed to go back. So I'm grateful that Holbrook Travel and the Florida Museum supported my accompanying Dr. Daniels to visually tell a story. I knew these opportunities didn't come often and I had to be organized and ready to bring back the original story I wanted to make in 2008. So armed with cutting edge equipment and freshly learned video skills, I had to focus and work on the content I so desired. So in addition to capturing video, I took a lot of still photos as well, which you've seen here today. One of my favorite moments was kneeling on a path to photograph flowers loaded with butterflies coming to nectar. So I was using a wide angle macro lens, which demands close proximity. And I became a flower myself at that point and was blanketed in butterflies while making pictures. So I'd heard that the local belief is that if butterflies land on you while you're in the sanctuary, you're being visited by loved, lost, lost loved ones. So not only was I filled with excitement for the pictures I was making, but I was experiencing a powerful grounding connection and a reminder that our natural world is as just as much a part of us as we are of it. So I hope uh, you all will have a chance to experience this incredible uh, event and really, truly, as Jarrett mentioned, it's it's a photographer's dream. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so at this point, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, our moderator today will be Lisa Palmisi Graubard. Lisa has been with Holbrook Travel for more than 30 years, and in her role as an educational travel specialist, she has organized hundreds of trips, and she's really been a key figure in terms of helping these monarch trips grow into what they are today. Uh, so welcome, Lisa. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Um, thanks, Lindsay. And um, thanks, Jarrett and Kristen. It's wonderful to see the pictures and hear your stories. I've had the honor of 
visiting the sites um, twice in the last couple of years. So seeing the pictures just brings back so many amazing memories. And of course, being in the field with um, Jarrett or Dr. Daniels, I should say, um, it's just amazing the amount of information that you gather and even just being on the bus and hearing the stories of research and the life cycle, it's just a wonderful opportunity. So I see that we have a lot of questions uh, to get to today. And if we don't have time to um, answer your question during the webinar, we are very happy to make sure that you get all the answers and information that you need um, in order to help the monarch conservation. And if you want to send questions, if I do not get to your questions, you may email them to me at lisa at holbrooktravel.com. You'll also be getting a um, recording of the webinar. So you could also use the email address from that. So let me get to these questions because we have some very interesting ones. Uh, we have um, a question that says, so for the monarchs that amass in St. Mark's Northwest Florida, south of Tallahassee, are they heading to Mexico or to South Florida? And that I guess would be for Jarrett. Yeah, so they, they um, that is a, a great kind of congregation area on their journey south to Mexico. Um, and most of those butterflies will be making their way along the Gulf Coast uh, down south into Mexico. Uh, we still don't know the fate of many monarchs that make their way down into peninsular Florida. Uh, so that is kind of a, a gray area or a black box area with the understanding of the migration as a whole. So we still need a lot of data to fill in some of those gaps, but uh, generally those that make their way to St. Mark's are making their way down to Mexico. Okay, and the next question is for um, Dr. Daniels. What is being done to improve the conditions for the monarch colonies to have the numbers bounce back? So the colonies themselves are really well cared for and there's a lot of um, kind of local uh, control over the monarch sanctuary. So very, very limited uh, logging or other activities are allowed in proximity to the colonies. So uh, most of the decline related to the monarch is actually being done north of the colonies into the US and Canada. Okay, and um, I will answer this one or Dr. Daniels can also assist. But it says, what are the ideal weeks and months to visit um, the overwintering sites in Mexico? And the, I, excuse me, Dr. Daniels can answer that. And then I can tell you that we do have um, two trips with the Florida Museum that are in February. And that is the traditional time that we have run the trips and gotten the great photos and the great experiences. But Dr. Daniels, what are the what is the window of months that you can see the monarch overwintering? Well, they they start arriving into many of the colonies um, in early winter, and then they'll reside in the overwintering colonies until you know maybe early mid March before making the journey back north. So, really, during that time, there's no bad time. But traditionally, as Lisa mentioned, February and in early March is a particularly good time for activity because it's getting a little bit warmer and there uh, certainly is more uh, activity within the colony itself to enjoy. Uh, if you go a little bit early when the conditions are particularly cold, you're gonna see some of the images that we showed earlier in the presentation of them sort of you know, residing on the tree branches themselves but not as much activity overall within the colony. Great. Um, so what is the monarch sex ratio in the overwintering sites? That's a really good question. I don't know the exact answer to that. I would assume that in general, it's, it's almost a 50-50 sex ratio as most species would, uh, would, uh, would have. Uh, certainly there is, there is a lot of mortality within the colony itself. So you will see, you know, dead butterflies on the floor as far, but this is just part of Mother Nature. It's nothing uh, insidious about the colonies themselves. Uh, so there is mortality 
uh, over the season of the overwintering colonies, uh, but I would assume that the sex ratio is about 50-50. Okay, and um, I have another one. How is it that one monarch can fly all the way from the Northern US and Canada to Michoacan in Mexico mm -hmm against Gulf Stream weather, and why does it take three generations for them to make it back? That's a great question. So the, the monarch, you know, most butterflies on average live only a few short weeks, and the monarch also um, follows that rule during the summer months when it's breeding. But as fall approaches, it gets cues from the environment, such as decreasing day length and decreasing temperatures, which cause a physiological change in the butterfly to shunt resources away from reproduction to the buildup of fat body content so it can store uh, and utilize energy on its long southward migration. Uh, but it, it's really trying to escape freezing temperatures. So it, it moves southward to escape the winter uh, and freezing temperatures. And then as spring approaches uh, and starts to hit the Southern latitude locations, Monarch butterflies recolonize those southern locations and follow spring northward latitudinally to recolonize much of eastern North America again. Because if they left early and, and flew to the Middle Plains or the upper Midwest in February or March, they would encounter conditions that are not uh, obviously ideal for continued breeding. So they're being opportunistically uh, opportunistic taking advantage of uh, the resources available to reproduce. Okay, and this is sort of along um, the line of answer you just gave. It says, can you please clarify, if one butterfly migrates south and is in Mexico, after that, the great-great-grandchild of that original butterfly is the one that actually returns to the um, Canada and the East Coast. And do some monarchs live longer than the others? And so that ties into what you just um, said. Yeah, so when they're breeding, they, they live only a few weeks. They're putting all their resources into laying as many eggs as they can, but when they overwinter, they're in a state of reproductive diapause where they're, they're not interested in breeding and their goal is to survive the, the winter months um, within the uh, monarch sanctuary. So they can live for several months as an adult butterfly. And then once uh, spring uh, arises, then those individuals will become reproductively active again, move a little bit further north, lay their eggs. Their offspring will move further north following spring northward, breed, and then their offspring will move further north. So it's a one-way migration down and a multi-generational migration back north. It's amazing. Um, we have a question here, um, especially um, for people in Florida. Can you comment on tropical milkweed in Florida um, in your home garden? Yes, so tropical milkweed is a common non-native that's readily available commercially. Um, and it poses some particular threats to the monarch because it does not die back like many other native milkweeds. So when monarch butterflies that are migrating southward encounter this plant, they often fall out of migration and breed. And this may sound wonderful to have butterflies in your home garden uh, in January in Peninsular Florida, but as I mentioned earlier, if you are in January and you get a freeze or frost event, it's gonna kill your monarchs, it's gonna kill your, or cause your plant to die back. So this provides uh, an, a, a condition for the monarch that is not helpful. So what we recommend is that first and foremost, you plant native milkweed and don't actually plant non-native tropical milkweed. If you do want to plant tropical milkweed, then we urge you to cut it back at Halloween and keep it cut back until about early March. And that way you're essentially taking out that resource during the winter months when some monarchs are either still moving southward or uh, making sure there are no resources available for monarchs to breed during the winter months on that plant. Okay. And um, another question in that same line, is there any species of milkweed that the monarch does not use? So, so, monarch, so milkweeds vary a lot with their cardenolide content, the toxic chemicals that monarchs incorporate into their tissues. And some of these um, are challenging even for the monarch to deal with. So there are certainly some milkweeds that are seldom used 
but uh, and certainly some milkweeds that monarchs prefer to use. But there are many, many species of milkweeds across North America. So it really varies depending on where you actually live. Interesting. Okay. Um, is it a good idea to buy children's kits where you can raise several monarchs and then release them, or is that a bad idea? So that's a really good question. So um, I, I guess in my opinion, and this is simply my opinion, the, the opportunity for children or for schools to raise butterflies as an educational opportunity is wonderful and to release them because they are learning about the natural world, about life cycles. What we, what we don't want to encourage is sort of mass breeding of monarchs. And there are increasing number of individuals that are breeding monarchs in, you know, in the hundreds or thousands and then releasing them. And this is generally not considered a really good activity. We'd rather have those, uh, those activities be limited and enjoy the monarch actually in its wild environment, but certainly small scale breeding for the opportunity of learning and understanding about the monarch and life cycles is certainly something that I think is a, a very good positive. Great. Now I have a question um, for Kristen. What's your favorite camera to take um, when you're um, photographing monarchs? That's a great question. So um, that's also a loaded question. Everyone's pretty particular about their camera brands. Um, I will say I've been an icon photographer uh, as long as I can remember. Um, but on this particular trip, we had just acquired um, the mirrorless Nikon Z6. And I will say it is um, exponentially lighter than the um, a non-mirrorless DSLR. And it made the hiking and photographing of monarchs a lot easier. So a mirrorless camera is going to be more compact and a little lighter. And, um, and the lenses are going to be a little um, less heavy as well. So if you're, you know, looking to trick, um, look into cameras like that. But, you know, a good um, resolution will help as well because then you'll be able to crop in if you don't have a zoom lens, a telephoto lens with you. Okay, wonderful. Um, this would be for Dr. Daniels. What kind of trees do the monarchs um, particularly like? And what is the temperature fluctuation in the sanctuaries in the mountains at night? Uh, so they, they overwinter on OML fir trees within the colony. And this, um, this is at a high elevation and the closed canopy of the forest kind of provides an umbrella to uh, not have freezing temperatures sort of penetrate into the forest. So the temperatures at night are hovering just above freezing. So it can get quite cold within the sanctuary, but generally not freezing. Of course, there are, uh, you know, historic events like snowstorms or freeze events that do happen, but generally just above freezing within the colony itself. Okay. Um... Lindsay, how am I doing on time? We probably have time for maybe one or two more if you want to um, to see if we have any that might be uh, quick, quick answers. Okay, um, here's a good one. What predators take advantage of the wintering um, colonies? So there's, there's quite a few. Um, so while the monarchs are technically chemically protected, there's a lot of variation in that protection and there are some monarchs that are actually quite palatable and some that are that are not. And there's also many organisms that have sort of, you know, evolved ways of dealing with some of those chemicals. So within the colony itself, there are several birds that do prey on monarchs. There are rodents that feed on monarchs. There's natural mortality. There's other insects and arthropods that prey on monarchs. So just because they're in the colony itself does not mean that they're still not potentially under threat from predators. Wow. Okay, and um, this is a good one to close out. How do you tell a female from a male and is it possible to tell the sex of a caterpillar? So it's, it's, it's not um, really visually possible to tell the sex of a caterpillar, but monarchs um, are actually quite easy. And then if you look at the hind wing of the monarch, males have a black spot kind of right almost in the center it's a spot that has um, specialized scales that emit semiochemicals for courtship. 
So it, females lack that kind of black spot and that's evident both on the upper surface and on the undersurface of the hind wing. So even from a distance with a pair of binoculars, you can tell male from female quite easily. Great. Um, well, I've got, uh, we have a lot of questions that we will be happy to answer offline. Uh, and um, do we have time for one more? Um, sure, yeah, if you wanna do one more, we can do that. Okay, well, someone is asking uh, a very important question. Uh, does tourism um, in the overwintering sites have any adverse impacts on the monarchs? Uh, and, yeah. yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to, to take a stab at that one. So, you know, obviously tourism has an, has an impact, uh, but particularly for these locations, I would say the positive impact of tourism significantly outweighs any potential negative impact. And many of the, the local stewards of the sanctuaries are really wonderful in ensuring that people stay on trails, that they don't disrupt the monarch uh, colonies themselves. So they take it very seriously and the, the sort of uh, stewardship that goes on is, is quite stellar. Uh, and certainly the economy of, of Anangeo and just the, the overall economy locally is, is significantly enhanced by tourism to see the monarchs. And that's a big driving force to ensure that these forests remain intact and um, are secure, you know, long-term. Yes, I just want to add that with the last year of the pandemic, um, tourism has been pretty non-existent. Some of the sanctuaries decided to close down so it did not infect their local populations. In doing that, it has greatly affected the economy. Um, the monarchs bring a wonderful sustainable tourism option and with the season coming and all of the visitors, I know that it has brought um, a way to earn a living to so many people that would normally be farming or illegally cutting down the trees that the monarchs need and selling the wood. So having the community involved with the tourism option makes them so protective and have ownership and they look out for the monarchs because they know it's important to their community. So I definitely feel that without having sustainable conservation tourism, it would um, negatively impact the, um, the environment that the monarchs need. So I'm, I'm happy to say that um, people are very eager to have visitors and it's very, very important to the conservation of the monarchs. Um, Kristen, this one is for you. Do you use prime lenses? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, again, it's really specific to what you're photographing. I've got a handful of prime lenses that I'll take with me depending on what I'm going out to shoot. Um, in this case, I needed a variety. Um, I had a wide angle macro lens, which allowed me to get within, you know, an inch of flowers and butterflies, but while showing the scenery, those wide angle lenses, the wide angle macro lenses more specifically are great when you're doing macro photography, but want to include the natural environment. Um, and then also when you're dealing with something as grandiose as a forest, um, a telephoto lens to get those monarchs that are way up in, um, in the treetops. But um, those fixed prime lenses really can come in handy if you're doing uh, specific types of photography as well. So it really, again, I've seen a couple of questions here talking about what type of camera, what type of lenses, and it's really great to do research on exactly what you're photographing um, and, and use what you need to, to photograph what you want to get. Great. Um, Lisa, I'm oh. going to jump in here. I think we're, we're right at time, so I don't want to go too far over. Okay. Um, uh, I'll just mention really quickly, we do have, um, it, well, first of all, thank you again to, uh, to Dr. Daniels and to uh, Kristen Grace for um, sharing their expertise with us today. Um, if you are interested in joining experts from the Florida Museum in the field, we do have two Monarch trips scheduled for February of 2022. Uh, so we will we'll be sending out details about these two trips if you'd like more information. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you wanna speak to, to those really uh, briefly. 
Well, we, we do have two back to back and one is with um, Dr. Daniels and the other is with Dr. Sorokoff and they go in the field into the sanctuaries with you, answer questions and are you know there to assist you and hopefully further your desire for monarch conservation. And this is a trip that we have done um, for the last six or seven years. Of course, the museum has done it for over 20 years. And um, it's just a pleasure to work on them. I have done the trip a couple times, so I'm available to answer any questions about conditions. Um, it's a wonderful trip, but there are some things to take in consideration on you know, getting up the mountain and, and what you're gonna experience. So I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has about that. Great, thank you. Um, and then lastly, I'll just mention that the Florida Museum is also hosting a really neat experience this summer in Costa Rica from June 28th to July 4th. Uh, this will be their annual rainforest camp, which is designed for families with children ages five through 17, and there is still time to sign up for that. Uh, so we'll be including more information about that as well um, if you're interested in uh, either attending that yourself or if maybe you know uh, a family with children that might be interested uh, in that opportunity. So um, I'll just wrap up by saying that today's webinar has been recorded. And again, we will be sending out a link to the recording in the next few days. Uh, the webinar recording will also be available on our YouTube channel and on our website where you can find all of our past webinars. So with that, we'll go ahead and conclude our uh, presentation today. Thank you again so much to our guests. Dr. Jarrett Daniels and Kristen Grace. Uh, we really appreciate hearing about these conservation initiatives and more about the monarchs and seeing your beautiful photography. Uh, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.